So this Shabbos, Shabbos Pasha's Akif Tavshim Pei Dalid, is the yard site, the 80th yard site of the Rebbe's father, Rebbe Levi Yitzchok Schneerson. Harav Agoin, Harav Makubul, Hatzadik, Rebbe Levi Yitzchok. I'd like to take a few moments to just review briefly his history so that we could share with our family, friends, and for praying about and talk about Shabbos. Reb Levi Yitzchok was a great grandson of the Tzemach Tzedek, Rebbe Nachem Endel of Lubavitch. His father was Reb Baruch Schneer, Schneerson. Reb Levi Yitzchok was born in Podrpanka, it's a city somewhere in Russia. He was born into the illustrious Schneerson dynasty, Schneerson family, which is full of scholarship, beautiful character, midas, sophistication, being aristocratic, and what's known as the overall Beis Harav, the household of the Rav, beginning with the Alter Rebbe, the Balatanya, the founder of the Chabad movement. Rebbe Levi Yitzchok was a going, a genius, not in Torah, Nigla, Talmud, Hasidus, and Kabbalah. One can say that that was his uniqueness, the Kabbalistic aspect, the element of Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism. He married Rebbe Tzachana. She was the daughter of Rebbe Meir Shleima Yanovsky, who was a son-in-law of Rabbi Lavut, who was a Rav in Nikolaev. And she was from, from there. And that is, after the marriage, Rebbe Yitzhak settled where his wife's family was in Nikolaev, and that's where the Rebbe was born in 1902 in Nikolaev. I think today they call it Mikolaev with an M, but originally it was with a Nun, an N, Nikolaev. The couple had three sons, the Rebbe, then a son, Beryl, Shalom Ber, and a son, Rabbi Yisrael Aryeleib. They had no daughters. They raised their children in the most special way of Taita, Chassidus, and scholarship. I believe Yitzchok became a Rav in 1909 in Yaktrinislav after the former Rav, the great Chabad Chassid Zev Wolf, a better wolf, I believe, passed away. So he was hired. Now there was another shul as well. I think that of there was Rabbi Gelman was his name. And I believe Yitzchok had many congregants, most of which were Anoshim Shutim, simple people. And here's what I really want to talk about a little bit more. My wife's grandfather, Reb Zalman Serebransky, I recorded him in 1988 or 89, saying, speaking about Reb Levi Yitzchok, who he knew because he visited him at home several times, I believe, to raise funds for the Chabad Yeshivas and the Machteres and the underground. And he said, and he was in the shul, in the house in the shul, and he said, if you saw the, the congregants, the mspalalim in the shul, they were noshim pshutim. And here they had this goin, this genius of Torah as their rav, but they didn't really, most of them didn't appreciate it and understand it and know it. He also said, that Zalman said, that Reb Levik had no, it wasn't a tzir. A tzir means I box myself into being a great rabbi, a great scholar, a great businessman. In other words, who am I? 
scholarship? Who am I, rabbinics? Who am I, business? This concept is called a seer. And as Alma said, today everything is about seurim. Now, mind you, he said this 40, almost 40 years ago. Everything is, you know, who am I, what you do, and what you're known as, and today, especially with social media, how many people click on your, on your podcasts and your talks and how many hits you have, on and on. He said, at that time, things were simple. And Ablavik was simple that way. And this is a lost art, but we could begin to reclaim it. It's very important, especially those that follow in the, in the way of Chabad, Hasidus, to reclaim the simplicity and sincerity without fanfare, without being a big knocker, a big shot, a big macher, a rashke behag. Rashke behag means a rash shobnei agoyla, like you know, everyone knows. Oh, he comes in. Oh, you have to stand up and you have to give him the front seat and on and on. Reb Levick, being a rov there from 1939 from 1909 to 1939, when they took him away for hard labor in. In, the, in, the, in that area in, in Kazakhstan, uh, Chile over there, which ultimately he passed away in Almaty after he was released in 1944. So he was 30 years of the rabbi in the shul in Yaktinislav, in, in the Dnieper, which is called today Dnieprovsk. This was a Lubavitcherov. In fact, I heard from Chassidim, they didn't even call them Rabbi Levi Yitzchak, they, they would Rabbi Levi Yitzchak, they would call him Levik Darov. Could you imagine? Here is a man who was a goyin, a genius of Nigla Chassidus and Kabbalah, and you call him Levik Darov. But that was the way people spoke. It wasn't because they were being chutzpahdik, disrespectful to their rabbi, to their rov. And it was acceptable then because that was the culture of the time. When I say reclaim this today, the culture has changed. And, have, you know, and it's normal to call someone rabbi, harav, or reb. But at the same time, don't take yourself so seriously. <laughs> okay? Don't take yourself so seriously. If someone doesn't call you rabbi, harav, and reb, and calls you by your first name, don't flip out. Don't get upset. Don't, don't, don't make a big deal about it. And this is necessary for our mindset today. And the, and the youth, our youth, who is our future, when they'll see this in us, and the old ones that are older, it'll make a great difference, a positive difference. So, Reb Levick, going back to his history, would stand up and speak his mind, and he wasn't scared of the KGB and the NKVD and the Russian authorities. They wanted him, for example, to say that all the wheat that was uh, being prepared for Pesach was kosher, and he heard about a situation where water got on it and it was it's invalid for for making matzah. He he said it loud and clear, and he wasn't scared that they're going to lock him up and kill him and murder him and take him away. If you want to do that, be my guest. He wrote Gitten. You know, people get divorced and you need to write a get. On the, on the day that he wrote a get, he fasted. He wouldn't eat. The pain that he had from having to write a get for a Jewish couple was took it very seriously. There's many, many stories with him and his relationship with Rebbe Tzachana. I heard from Rebbe Yoel Khan, my Mashpia several things that she, that he and his Rebbe and Leah, may she be well, heard from the Rebbe's mother about her husband, Reb Levick. It's fascinating to see how they, they lived together, they ate together, they cried together, they spoke together. It was very difficult. Their son, the Rebbe, leaves them at age 27, goes to Leningrad to be with his future father-in-law, then gets married and goes off to Berlin, and they never see him. He, the Reblevik, didn't see him again. He could have seen him. 1927, the Reblevik was fine till 1939, but he ends up not seeing him. 
was very difficult to travel. Then after the Mlevik was taken away and ultimately died from, from illness at such a young age, the Mlevik was born, I believe, in 1879, and he passes on in 1944. So he's 64, 65 years, he's a young man. And Rebbe Tzanchana, his wife, is left alone. They just had on Chabad.org a wonderful uh, article written originally in, in Yiddish and Hebrew, I believe, by uh, Rabbi Yisab Nemoitin, who took care of Rebbe Levik and his wife during those years in Alma'ata. And uh, he, he records very important historical information. And one of the things he writes there is about the difficulties that the Rebetzin, she didn't want to go out, she didn't want to meet people, she wanted to be alone. Kind of, she was in a depression. She lost her husband, her son is not with her. She's all alone in Almata. And the Yezheb Nemaitin with a few others tended to her and he was able to secure tickets for her to go to Moscow. And she went to Moscow, she agreed Normally she would, you know, not want anything from anyone. She would do it herself, but she had no choice. And that's how she, she got out from Moscow. She went with the Hasidim on the Shalonin, on the uh, Great Escape, as it's called, in 1946, I believe. She made her way to France, and that's where the Rebbe came in 1947 and took her back to America and she lived to mid 80s and she passed away in 1964 on Vav Tishrei. So the story of Reb Levik, whose yard site it is this Shabbos, 80 y years, is a story of this, this, not just the survival, but the thriving, not just a surviving Judaism, a, a surviving Chabad Hasidism, but a thriving Chabad Hasidism in the face of all odds. And this Shabbos, I understand there's a, a thousand people, King Yirbu at his holy grave site, and bringing together, learning together, davening together, praying together in Alma Atta. So we who are in our shuls, in our communities, we should take some time and really today try to read this article on Chabad.org for yourself and share it with your family, with your friends at Fabrengens. There's a lot of inspiration there. And it's also the Tevis for the benefit of the Neshama, but of Yosef, the Might, and what he did for them, for the Rebbe's father and mother. And that's why the Rebbe was grateful to him beyond words. For what he did, the Rebbe couldn't do it himself. He wasn't there, and he felt that his his people, his Hasidim, that reached out and helped his parents, are everything to him, because it was his obligation. And the Rebbe took the obligation, as we know, of Kibbutz Aim, respecting your parents to the greatest heights. May Hashem help that we only have Simchas and the Shama and Levi Yitzchok Ben Raporuk Shneir to return with the coming of Mashiach together with our Rebbe and we'll rebuild the base on Mikdash, Yerushalayim, Yerakoydash, Amen, the Amen, Good Shabbos, Good Shabbos, Good Shabbos.